Hi YouTube, it's the Hawaiian Shirt Coder here. Ever wondered how to build a web API? Let's have a look. Hi YouTube, it's the Hawaiian Shirt Coder here again and this is the first video in my web API series. In this particular video there won't be any code, it's just going to set the scene of what we'll be discussing in several up and coming videos. So basically the aim of this series is to lead you from zero to hero in terms of producing a web API in ASP.NET Core. So about this series, what's the sort of things you will be learning and discovering with me? Well firstly, you'll be discovering that I make lots of mistakes as I go along, but I leave these in as I think this helps with the learning process. So we'll be learning and discovering as I go along and as I make errors. So the errors are almost as important as the finished product. So just to give you a flavour, and this isn't a complete list, but just to give you an overview of what's coming in future videos, there'll be a little bit of theory, which we may even discuss if there's time in this video of the history of websites, just to sort of set the stage on where we are. What exactly are web APIs? And then in future videos, like I said today, this one won't contain any code. So this is death by PowerPoint for today. Sorry about that. But once we get into the actual build of a RESTful web API in .NET, this will break down into several videos because there are lots of subsections to consider. So we will be talking about things like the data we want to capture, how we authenticate to our web API, where we store, our data from our web API in terms of database storage, any middleware, any documentation, the various HTTP codes that we sit on the back of. So this middle bullet point does actually involve quite a few subsections that will be broken up hopefully into nice manageable chunks. Also as well, once we've got a basic web API in place, we will be looking at how we can test our web API in terms of unit tests and integration tests. We'll also look at how we can consume that web API to make use of it, and there's several ways we can do that. And we will even probably, if time allows, create a very basic front-end UI that will consume our web API and make a useful application. So in order to go through the process of building a web API, we need a scenario. So I sat for a while thinking what would be a good example of a system that we could build that most people would have a general understanding of what it does. So I came up with a sports management system. And this sports management system is very basic, but could be useful. And it consists of three key entities. It consists of fixtures. So a sports club will have fixtures against opponents that will be on certain dates, at certain venues, and at certain times. Your sports club also will consist of a series of members or players who play for that sports club, whatever the sport may be. And that is our sort of register of all the members of our club so it has people's names it has their email addresses it has their mobile phone numbers the bit in the middle called availability is a bit that we will add in later on in our video series to make a more complete application so for a given fixture a team needs so many players who are available to play in that fixture so this is where there is some linkage between fixtures and players. A player is available for one or more fixtures. And that's where we get a fully rounded system that we can actually put a UI on the front that will allow a player to log in to the application and look at the fixture list and say I'm available on these dates. 
but just to get started with our focus will be around fixtures and will be around players. The availability is the cherry on top of the cake at a later date when most of the things are in place. So if you want to follow along with any of these up and coming videos that I'm going to be working on, you'll need a few things in place. Eventually the code will be placed in a GitHub repository so you can download it and have a play with it yourself. If you want to code along with me, these are the things that you will need on your local machine. So first of all, you will need a code editor so you can write your .NET code. You have two options available to you that are both free. You can use Visual Studio 2022, which is the latest version of Visual Studio at the time of recording. And the version that you want that is free is the Community Edition. Or your other option is to have a more lightweight editor and that is VS Code, which is also free, which can be used for programming in any sort of language really, but has some extensions that allow you to work in C Sharp. Uh, the other thing that you will need, which if you use the Visual Studio root, will get installed with the actual editor, is .NET 7, which is the most up-to-date .NET framework at the time of recording. But if you are using Visual Studio Code, you will also need to do this as a separate download using .NET 7 for free. Finally, the last thing that you'll need is somewhere to store the information that we're going to save, and that will be a database. The database, again, can be free, and that can be either SQL Express or Microsoft SQL Server Developer Edition. And it must be developer edition if you're using Microsoft SQL Server, as all the others are licensed pieces of commercial software. But we can get more onto the database side in some later editions, because that isn't our initial focus at the start. So before we can start writing any code, we need to understand a little bit of theory and see how this theory fits into the Microsoft ecosystem with regards to websites and also uh, web APIs. So on this slide we've got a very quick and dirty history of websites. So I split this down at a very high level into four sections. So way back when, when I was just starting out as a junior developer, the only sort of internet web pages you had were static web pages. These web pages were made up of technologies such as HTML markup code, cas cascading style sheets for uh, giving a look and feel. Uh, quite often that was actually hard coded within the HTML rather than in the separate CSS file. And there may be a little bit of um, user interaction with bits of JavaScript, but not much. Basically these sites were static. If you visited them one day, they would look exactly the same the next day. Their content didn't get updated. They were brochureware sites, basically. Then the big step came along when a few things happened. We moved into HTML5, uh, which allowed us to have a more sort of uh, rich interactive sort of application where you could embed other things such as video and sound uh, and there would be more of a syntax to the HTML markup but more importantly as well we could start having dynamic content so these were known as dynamic websites so they still worked off HTML uh, rather than HTML4 this was probably now HTML5, uh, it had some CSS again and the things like uh, Less and Sass were coming along to improve the things that we could do with our styling of our web pages and there was more JavaScript. But more importantly our information was probably coming from a store or a database. Uh, so in order to speak with that database, all of a sudden there was an advent of server-side technologies that would do all the back-end processing. So I've entitled this server-side rendering, 
and the, in the very early days this was done in a non sort of web programming language method so it was done with something known as CGI um, don't need to speak about that now is that sort of dead and buried uh, and then in my early days of doing web development and dynamic web pages we used classic ASP which was basically a VB script that allowed you to write bits of logic and intermingle it with the HTML markup and then .NET came along and .NET's first offering was a thing called ASP Web Forms which if you come from a Visual Basic background was trying to make the web like a desktop application where you would drag and drop various controls on the page be it buttons, drop down lists, text boxes etc and then click on those various controls to put events behind it so it's trying to be an event driven programming model had limited success with that uh, as the web is very different to a desktop application uh, and now Microsoft have uh, discontinued web forms. The one that was far more popular and more standardized across the whole industry, not just Microsoft, was to use MVC, which stands for Model View Controller. Model View Controller is still relevant today, and many websites are still built using the Model View Controller method. In fact, web APIs work off that same sort of paradigm of Model View Controller. But today what you'll find to be the most popular way of producing a website is a thing called a SPA or a single page application. This is where we've split the logic somewhat. So all the dynamic getting stuff from the database, business logic, all the back end stuff is handled by a web API, which is what this series is all about for handling the back end logic and data. Um, in the early days, uh, sort any sort of web API was built using uh, something called ASMX. So this is around about the same time as web forms. Uh, again, this isn't really used anymore, but underneath the hood of these uh, ASMX pages was basically SOAP. SOAP is a method now quite an old method of sending xml in a certain sort of um, format in a letter header envelope uh, with the data in when you make a call to that service nowadays uh, the two common ones that are used are restful uh, web apis which is the series is uh, which is what this series is all about and also another thing known as GRPC, which is another sort of web API that has been developed through Google. Uh, that is out of scope for this particular series, but may appear in a future series. So the back end has developed over time and we are looking at RESTful. So that basically returns data to and from the client. There is no UI involved with a web API. It is interested in serving and receiving data and applying logic to that data. In order to produce our websites using this SPA approach, we need a front end framework for rendering the data to the user. This has become very popular because um, there are lots of them out there. Most of them are in the realms of the JavaScript world. So we can build a front end spa with vanilla JavaScript, with jQuery, with Knockout, Vue.js, and probably the two most popular ones at the time of recording are Angular, which is very opinionated in the way that you produce your web page and React.js, which was developed by Facebook and is far less opinionated in the way that you produce your front-end uh, code. These are all JavaScript. The one interesting one that has come into play um, over the last 18 months or so is a Microsoft technology 
known as Blazer. Uh, Blazer isn't really the scope of this series, but what Blazer is, is it allows you to write uh, in your language of choice, which is C Sharp, and push that C Sharp code down into the browser so it actually runs in the browser. This is known as Blazor WebAssembly. So rather than having to learn a server side programming language, which in our case would be C Sharp, and then a front end uh, language, which would be one of the JavaScript frameworks, we can actually write everything from front to back in Blazor. So we've learned a little bit about the history of websites. The next thing now is to go into a little more, more of a deeper dive with what is a web API. And more importantly for our course that we're going through at the moment, what is a RESTful web API? So a RESTful web API uh, I've sort of summarized as a series of methods that you can call via a URL in your address bar of your browser to retrieve or post data to the back end server stroke database. REST works by sitting on top of the HTTP protocol and the HTTP protocol is basically a protocol that's been around for a long, long time, from right back in the early days of static websites, and it is what serves you up your web page. So when you make a request to a website, www.asp.net, for example, that is using HTTP protocol to go off to the server and get you that page and return back to you in that particular instance HTML, images, JavaScript, and CSS. What uh, the HTTP protocol does with our web APIs, rather than turn back HTML, it will return back a data format. And that data format will either be XML, or more commonly these days, JSON, JavaScript serialized object notation back to the client and then the client can handle uh, that JavaScript like it does any other JavaScript and do something with it. The key thing with the HTTP protocol is it is a transport between the client and the server. It just happens to be a transport for data rather than actual web pages. HTTP works off verbs. There are a series of verbs, but the most common ones you will use are get, post, put or patch and delete. Get is the same sort of thing uh, if we were using a database analogy as selecting the data from a database. So get is selecting data. The post uh, verb is the same as if you're in the database writing an insert statement into a database put or patch, which are slightly different, but to achieve the same thing, is actually the same as you performing an update against the database or a backend store. And the delete one says what it uh, says on the tin, which is basically it allows you to delete that data from the underlying store or database. So in summary, a web API is basically a series of method calls to a remote location over the internet using HTTP that will return you or allow you to send data. So that's all I want to say in this video for this moment in time. So all I would say is if you like the sound of the API series, don't forget to subscribe, comment, or press the notification bell for future updates when they get released. Remember to keep learning, keep exploring, keep developing.